back, everyone. In this next and final session, we're going to be talking about the importance, the imperativeness of climate journalism. Climate journalism plays a vital role in informing the public and empowering people to act and shape a greener and more sustainable future. We're now going to welcome to the stage a journalist who has written about science, climate change, and technology for the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, among other publications. Help me to welcome newly minted author Debbie Lockwood on her debut book, 1001 Voices on Climate Change. And let's also please welcome back Miranda Massey, director of New York City's Climate Museum. We are so excited to be here with you, Debbie, to help launch this fabulous book that you've brought into the world. Um, Des, I want to let you know that there are no slides currently showing in the downstage monitor. Um, we will be just fine without them, but it would be great if you guys could get them up. Um, this is a huge book. It may look like I'm able to hold it in my hands, but it's a book that touches stories on every inhabited continent which Debbie traveled to with an open heart and an open mind to gather stories about how the climate crisis is affecting people everywhere now. All kinds of different people whom she approaches with an unbelievably profound and palpable compassion, with wry humor, and above all, with this wide open curiosity that's a real model for some of the traits that we need to bring to addressing the climate crisis together. You'll learn about geopolitics. You'll learn about ice core science. You'll learn about cargo shipping. You will visit with scientists, with climate denialists, with coal plant engineers, with adolescents and with elders, and you will connect with humanity on the front lines of dealing with the climate crisis. I can't recommend it highly enough. And if you want to join Debbie after our conversation, um, you can pre-order and reserve a signed copy of the book at The Strand. Um, she'll be out um, to, to meet with you and talk with you near where the registration table is out, outside of this hall. Um, so Debbie, welcome. It's Thank joy. You to connect with you again in person. Um, and uh, by way of introducing your audience to the book, I'd love for you to tell us about the origin story of this project, because to me it carries really profound lessons about trauma and uh, recovery, trauma and resilience. Sure. Well, first, thank you all so much for being here. And thanks to the whole team who's putting this on. It's such a joy to be here in conversation with Miranda. Um, this project kind of had a little bit of a weird origin story, but I was living in the Boston area during the year in which the Boston Marathon bombings happened, and we were locked down as a city for multiple days. It was a scary time, and I emerged from that time when it was possible to go back outside again, realizing that I wanted nothing more than to have conversations with strangers. And <laughs> I um, was living in a cooperative house at the time and went underneath the sink and found this big cardboard box that had been used to ship us some broccoli. And <laughs> I cut it open and wrote open call for stories um, in Sharpie, as you can see there. And I just walked around the city with that and an audio recorder and a bunch of balloons because I thought I needed more attention drawn to myself, I guess. But um, people told me all kinds of stories, everything from an MTA officer um, who wished that he could have one more cup of coffee with his mother to a woman who had just come from Haiti in the aftermath of an earthquake there and was talking about what it feels like to be displaced in a new place. And I was so moved by those stories. It felt like I was doing something right. Suddenly, mm. the world around me was alive with stories and storytelling. And um, it just felt like a way of connecting with people across all sorts of lines of difference. 
And that summer, I did a bike trip down about 800 miles of the Mississippi River Trail. So I started in Memphis, Tennessee, and I ended in Venice, Louisiana, where the river meets the Gulf of Mexico. And along the way, I wore that same goofy open call for stories sign. I realized that it was perhaps a little bit vague because people asked me if I was selling telephones. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, the farther down the river I was riding my bike, the more stories I was hearing specifically about water and climate change when it came to things like intensifying storms or people making the decision to leave a town that they had called home for generations um, because of being unsure if that place would be inhabitable in the future. And those stories to me were really sticky. Like I could feel them on the inside of my ribs. I couldn't stop thinking about them. And I wanted to put those stories of water and climate change in dialogue with stories from other parts of the world. Um, so I applied for um, and was fortunate to get a grant for a year of purposeful wandering after graduation. And I kind of made one year turn into five <laughs> and um, spoke to as many people in as many places as I could. And about half of that journey happened by bicycle and it was incredible. Well, we are all so grateful that that was your response to the tragedy of, at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Um, it's an incredible reaction to have had, that willingness to be vulnerable and to listen. And um, I want to ask you to tell us in some detail about your first port of call sure. on that bike. And if you can let the audience know which of these gold dots, which you all probably will have guessed, are the different places where stories come from in Debbie's book, the, the different nations. In many cases, there are many stories from a given nation. but. Um, Tuvalu was yeah. your first stop, as I understand it. Sure, I guess maybe I should just pop right up and uh, point Excellent. it out. So Tuvalu is right here. Um, <laughs> if it weren't with a big, gigantic gold dot right there, we would have to zoom in probably 50 times to be able to even see the beginnings of this place. But it is a coral atoll nation in the South Pacific, um, more than 500 miles south of the equator. And around 10,000 people call Tuvalu home. It's a group of eight islands, and I was there for a month in uh, the end of 2014, early 2015. And one of the main impacts of climate change in Tuvalu has to do with both food and water security. So I met um, the chief meteorological officer there at the time, his name was Tuala Katea, and um, he told me that in Tuvalu, um, people were first experiencing these impacts of climate change to do with water when it came to the, the groundwater. So there used to be a freshwater lens under the island that is um, relatively shallow, but people could dig a hole into the ground and have fresh water for drinking, bathing, any other use of water that you could imagine. And um, in the early 2000s, people in the outer islands started to notice that that water was becoming both salty and contaminated. Um, and Des, in the back, you could go to the next slide if you'd like. Um, one of the amazing things, this is the main island of Funafuti, and you can see that long line in the middle is the airplane runway strip. So when you're descending, it looks like you're gonna come down and land in the water until the absolute last second. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you pull up into this very improbable strip of land. Um, the majority of the population lives on the main island here. And another fun thing about the runway that I loved was that you know only a couple of planes come in each week and there's not a fence or anything along it. So a siren will go off to let everybody know to get off of the runway. But the rest of the time it's a mixed use, like soccer pitch, volleyball is played there. People will run in circles around it. If it's a really hot night, as it sometimes is, people might sleep on the runway even to get an extra amount of breeze. Um, and you can go to the next slide as well. Um, so th this is really where one of the first impacts of climate change was seen. So these are um, either taro or pulaka crops, and it's kind of a starchy root staple of Tuvalu and cuisine. And um, they started to rot in the outer islands. People were confused as to why, and it was found to be linked to um, saltwater intrusion linked to sea level rise. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is an example of a well that um, a Tuvaluan my age showed me. Um, her name was Losite. She was confused as to why I would want to see it. She was like, Debbie, sis, there's, there's nothing there. It's just a trash heap, right? You could people through old potato chip bags and things down there. But up until the early 2000s, people were able to have access to fresh drinking water there. 
And um, yeah, it's, you know, it shows the impacts of something that's quite small. The Australian government has been monitoring the level of the seas at the main wharf since I think the early 90s, and it's only about four millimeters of sea level rise per year. And that doesn't sound like that much, but the highest point on the island is only 13 feet above sea level. And so you get these dramatic impacts when it comes to water, and water impacts, of course, everything else. Um, Des, you can hit the next slide, too. So these are um, a few Tuvaluans who were my age, we're all in our 20s. Um, and another impact of climate change when it comes to people's lives and livelihoods has to do with migration. So um, Angelina, who's to my left there at the far right of the image, she um, and her husband have been applying for what's called a Pacific Access Category visa. So many younger generations of Tuvaluans don't see their future as being in the island. And so there's a relationship set up with the government of New Zealand and also with Fiji, whereby it's relatively easy for people to migrate. You kind of enter a lottery um, and have to fill out an application. I think it's on hold because of the pandemic, but that is a reality where you know older generations don't want to leave because the bones of their ancestors are buried in the front yard. They see climate change as an act of God. But younger generations are adamant that their future might only be possible somewhere else. Um, and Losita, who's um, to my right, or kind of in the, the middle of the image there, um, she has since moved, moved to Fiji and is working as an elementary school teacher there. So it's a kind of sign, I guess, of what, what is to come. Um, and one, one other point I just wanted to make, um, if Desi could hit the next slide as well. Um, so this is, again, Angelina with her family. And one story she told me that was sticky um, that I couldn't stop thinking about was about the last drought that had happened. So all of the water now comes from rain for Tuvaluans, and there is a pipe attached to the roofs that are then surrounded by a drum full of rainwater. And when there's not enough rain, people have to make really hard decisions about what to do with that water. And um, about a year before I visited the islands, there was a drought. And there is a desal plant, but it's very expensive to run, and each household is limited to a bucket about this size in the morning and one at night. Many people live in one home. And she told me that you know, she and her husband and her older kids could go to the lagoon to wash themselves um, in the salt water. But for her newborn baby at that time, she would get just a terrible rash if she was to wash her in the salt water. And so she, as the woman of the household, was having to make a decision about whether to have water to bathe her child or whether to have water for things like drinking and cooking rice. And that is just you know, one of many impacts of climate change that people are experiencing around the world. That, that part of the Tuvalu section of your book was so profound to me. And also just the whole idea of growing up knowing that you may have to leave your whole national culture, your whole cultural heritage, and also having to feel matter of fact about that in a way, because you don't have the luxury of feeling any other way about it. Yeah. Um, and the kind of the pr profundity of that, of that cultural loss. Yeah, I mean, there are large expat communities of Tuvaluans in right. both Suva and Fiji and Auckland in New Zealand. Yeah. And, you know, they still maintain aspects of their traditions, for of sure. Course. But of what course. does it mean? It's such a big question. And one of the big questions that motivated this book, really, is what does it mean for home to potentially become uninhabitable within my lifetime, right? And what does it mean for home to, you know, have to be picked up and, and moved somewhere else? It felt like such a heavy question, but one that so many of us are going to need to cope with within the coming decades. Yes, yeah. or even now. Mm -hmm. Or even now, yeah. A lot of the strong themes of the book emerge or start to emerge in the Tuvalu section, and we won't have a slideshow on every, for every dot up here on the map. Yeah. Um, but I did want to ask you to take a moment to highlight some of the other super memorable uh, stories and people you encountered on your travels. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to, you know, make a hierarchy of these stories. Everyone was a gift, and I am so grateful for every person who took the time to talk with me around the world because I fundamentally believe that everyone has something to teach us if we just make the time to, to listen to them. Right. 
Um, but just three that stick with me really quickly. Um, one is a woman named Tanea Tangaroa. She is Maori indigenous based in Wanganui, New Zealand. And she spent two decades restoring a wetland that was formerly used as a landfill and it's unlined. So there's still issues of water contamination in her community, but this, um, Ripo, which is the Maori word for that type of wetland, has become just a sanctuary, again, for native birds and native plants. And 20 years that she spent hauling out tires and mitigating different types of pollution in that area, um, she could really see the results. And I think it kind of reminded me that sometimes good things take time, but the consistency of her work, and she's now you know, applying techniques of environmental education to get the kids in her community engaged with these themes, um, I just found to be so moving. Another person whose story sticks out, um, her name is Marie Airu. Um, she's an elder in her 70s who lives in a town in Canada in Igloolik, Nunavut, so way north of the Arctic Circle. And she and her husband would uh, hunt for all sorts of different things as subsistence um, for food. And she told me about how she's witnessed in the decades of her life how warmer waters is changing the walrus migration patterns. So hunting, of course, being the main source of nutrition for people in these communities, they're having to go farther and farther away um, in order to find access to the animals that they once were able to hunt more easily. And that was profound. Um, and then one last one that I'll leave you guys with. There's you know, hundreds more in the book, and I hope you'll check it out if this is at all of interest. Um, but this is a story I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. It's a, a man named Ashanila. Um, he's in his 20s, grew up in Afghanistan, and we met in Kazakhstan a couple years ago. And he told me a really difficult story about how there wasn't access to safe drinking water in his community where he grew up. And um, as a result, his family would have to gather water from a river and then boil it in order for that to become safe and potable. And there was some kind of an accident that happened where um, he was watching his brother, that water was boiling and the water came down on him. And his brother ultimately passed away from those burns. And you know, I was wearing my cardboard sign that said, tell me a story about water at a conference kind of similar to this one. And he came up on the very last moment of the very last day to tell me the story. And he was trembling as, as he spoke it to me. And he said, I've, I've never told anyone this before. But for, for Ashan, it's motivated an entire career in engineering where he doesn't want anyone else in Central Asia to have to deal with that same issue. Um, he said, if only we had access to safe water in my community, my brother would still be alive. And I was just so, so moved by that and so grateful that he took the time to share it as well. Well, it's a profound testament to what you're able to project about who you are, uh, that he would tell that story to you for the first time. So yeah, we're know. all thankful for that. Yeah, and um, he said thank you at the end too, yeah. right? I think sometimes uh -huh. it feels good to talk about hard things. Right. And, of course. And um, sometimes we just need to make more spaces to listen to each other. Yeah. Agreed. I, I think any, any, any one of you who reads this book will come away with a powerful intention to listen more <laughs> and to create more space for listening. Um, somewhat more, um, um, in a somewhat more pragmatic mode, al although this is still incredibly important, I think one of the things that struck me, and I think if I'm, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a connection between the Tuvalu story and the um, Igaluk story, those are subsistence communities that climate change has forced into the international stream of commerce in terms of needing to purchase food uh, that they used to be able to grow or hunt themselves, often overpriced food, which has been shipped usually in ways that contribute to the climate crisis over long distances. It just struck me as a a theme that recurred in terms of the, the physical daily impacts of the climate crisis on people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. In, in both Tuvalu and in Igluluk, I would right. say that that's a, a lived reality. It's a lived reality. To with. Yeah. And it's hard for us, you know, we, we buy potato chips every day, or at least I buy potato chips every day, but um, uh, that's a big, that's a very enormous change to how, you, to how you go about your daily round and how you understand yourself in the world. Um, a thing that I truly love about this book is your democratic ethos in 
your generosity and the way you will listen to anybody. Again, whether it's a denialist or a coal plant engineer, whether it's an adolescent or a 90-year-old. Um, and one group of people you recurrently um, speak to and, and one group of people's stories you recurrently share uh, is scientists. And um, they might, they didn't know that you were gonna go on to get a master's degree from MIT in science journalism, but I know that. <laughs> and I feel compelled to ask you about that. Why is it important to include those science stories and those stories about scientists in a book like this? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I think Science communication is so important. It's one of the biggest challenges that we have in yeah. climate communications in general, frankly, is that of the people who I encountered who we might put on the spectrum of climate deniers, um, there was a big gap, I would say, in just science education, science understanding. They were suspicious of the science because it didn't make sense to them. And I see that as kind of a failure of, of education and communication in the science realm. And right. one thing I really wanted to do in this book was not only speak to scientists, but ask them questions that would kind of get them out of the jargon of their own discipline. Jargon is really important. It's a shorthand that experts can use to communicate with each other, but it can also be kind of alienating, <laughs> right? Um, and even I have that feeling if I read a scientific paper, I have to you know, take a couple steps back and almost unravel and, and um, try to understand what's happening. And so what I wanted to do was just ask questions of these exer experts, excuse me, that would um, lead in the direction of answers that would be understandable to the general public because I think that there is this gap still in, in climate communications and that it can be filled by really fun things like metaphor <laughs> or, um, you know, I, I would frequently, ask, I still do this in, in my journalism work, ask experts, you know, how would you explain this to an eight-year-old? And right. they're like, oh, oh okay, <laughs> right? So there's ways of breaking down disciplinary jargon that ultimately just make the science more accessible. And when the science is more accessible, I think everyone benefits. Everybody wins, totally agree. And when it's embedded in an emotional story about a person who jumps off the page, as it is here, even more so. Thank you, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's really hard to empathize with a number, and so much of the conversations we have about climate change are in terms of numbers, whether it's millimeters or feet even of sea level rise, right? or whether it's degrees of temperature change, but like, what does that mean? What does that feel like to live with that change? And that was really the motivation to going out and speaking with people in this way, right? Right. Well, it really comes across. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. One of, um, another, another episode um, in the book that I, I wanted to ask you to tell your audience about is the UN climate meeting, the Conference of the Parties, or COP, that took place in 2016 in Morocco, and the, um, the story of the presidential to-do list. Sure. <laughs> if I can cue that up for you, um, the all-nighter the all presidential to-do list. Sure. Um, so I traveled to COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco, with a group called Sustain Us, which is a um, group that empowers youth, I think defined as under age 30, um, here in the States to travel to different UN meetings in order to advocate for youth voices in those kinds of conversations. And, you know, we didn't have any negotiating power, of course. We were there in a civil society capacity, and I kind of snuck my way into the press room, which was really fun. <laughs> Um, sort of uh, crystallized, I guess, my determination to pursue journalism at that point because seeing all of the you know, folks at work was just so wonderful and energizing. Um, but the, the group I was with were mostly organizers and um, they had brought some paint and a big sheet with us to Morocco and we didn't have any paint brushes. So I think people were painting first with a toothbrush and then with their fingers, they gave up on the toothbrush. Um, and this is on the eve of the election. Evening of the presidential election. And you know, everyone was kind of convinced that Hillary Clinton was gonna be elected and that she was perhaps more centrist on climate policies. And so it would be beneficial to um, advocate for things that we would want to be on the presidential to-do list. And those included things like zero by 2050 and honoring the treaties with indigenous groups here and um, respecting indigenous sovereignty and protecting water, um, all sorts of 
things were on that list. And as the night wore on, um, the group realized we were watching the um, election needle that the New York Times had, which was an interesting and um, stressful <laughs> experience, and realized that the likelihood was slimming and that, in fact, Donald Trump was going to be elected. And so someone in the group had the idea to cross off peoples and make it, or sorry, cross off presidential and make it instead the people's to-do list. And that sheet was unfurled at that UN conference and then traveled all around the US after. It was kind of a, I guess, a rallying cry for many uh, in the climate activism space to understand that um, sometimes or maybe oftentimes it's best to rely on the people rather than folks in power in order to achieve what needs to be done. Right. Yes, it turns out that may always be true. W word, to the, word to the wise in this room. Um, finally, before we hand it over to the people who've come out to hear about your book and meet you for a question and answer, um, can you just say a little about listening as a practice, how your relationship to it changed over the course of the book, who you were most interested in listening to, though clearly it was pretty much one and all, um, and, and what you learned about listening in the course of, of making this marvelous work. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one way in which I was really changed by the process of doing this mm -hmm. journey. Um, I re-listened pretty early on to some of those recordings I made on that first bike trip down the Mississippi River, and I realized that I was interjecting, I was listening with the intention to respond. I had a question in mind even as someone was speaking and I was really uncomfortable with silence and I wanted to fill it with words as quickly as possible in order to avoid any awkwardness. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh God, I'm not even really listening, I'm, I'm speaking. And those are two different things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of developed a technique the longer I did this of deep listening and that means listening without the intention to reply right away. That means being comfortable with silences sometimes because that might just be the other person thinking. Um, and it also means, you know, asking prompting questions occasionally but not trotting over the other person as they're speaking. And um, for me, that became kind of a guiding ethos. But I think, you know, listening is so important where we're at in climate change right now because we need to be bringing more voices into the conversation, right? The people who are the most impacted are those who can, I think, best point us towards solutions. And, and one thing I was really trying to do in this book is to break down the idea of expertise, right? Mm. People are experts in their own lived experience. Right. And I wanted that to come through right, for people's lived experiences to be able to be in conversation with climate scientists and for those lived experiences to be able to inform the future that we want to create and, and frankly just a deeper understanding of the many complicated, knotted issues that we're dealing with right now. Well, the, the powerfulness of this book makes me confident that the platform you've created for those voices for those people who are not historically listened to enough, um, will have an impact. I have no doubt about that, Debbie. Thanks. Yeah, it's a I, huge I hope gift. so. Yeah, it's I hope we can gift. just all, you know, listen more to to many different types of voices. It's, it's really what we need. Yeah. Yeah, it's you've modeled a, an incredibly inclusive form of collective leadership for everybody who who reads the book. Um, so. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you all for being here. I'm sure that you guys have questions for Debbie, so please ask away. And before I forget, let me um, remind you that she'll be available to talk to you one-on-one -on -one near the registration table after we leave the stage. And you can also, at that table, scan a QR code and reserve a signed copy of her book from The Strand. Yeah, who's up first? I think the mic is on the move. It's a little hard for us to see. Oh, looks like the mic is on the move. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your 
talk. It was very inspiring. Um, obviously, it's a lot of points on the map, and every story will have a cultural and, you know, natural context in which it exists and is told. I was wondering if any patterns emerged across some or all of the points of anything that stood out to people, um, you know, across all of those differences and all those barriers. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, touched on it in, in the Tuvalu piece, mm -hmm. um, but I think that migration for folks who are severely impacted is very much front of mind. And for those who can, um, it, it becomes kind of a, an imperative and sometimes. I, I think about uh, this modern dancer I met in Bangkok, his name was Soon, and he told me that he grew up in the rural north, his family had been farming rice for generations. And he made the decision to come to Bangkok in part to be able to better pursue his art, but also because with the rainfall patterns becoming more unpredictable, it wasn't as viable of a path for stability to farm for rice as it was in past generations. And there's just so many ways in which, you know, of course that when, when we change where the rain fall, it, it falls, it impacts where we're able to grow food. And when that changes, it impacts where people are able to live. And it's just all this kind of, um, it's a, a, a loop of <laughs> feedback, I guess we could say, where people are having to make decisions about where home is. And so there's the displacement, displacement portion, there's the migration portion, and then there's the just larger question of, what is home, who is home, and how can we make, is it possible to even remake home in a different place? Yeah, and, and one other thing I would wanna highlight, I, and I, <laughs> it, it's, it's almost a weird thing to say, but there's so much joy everywhere, like even mm -hmm. in these really dire circumstances, right? In, in Tuvalu, for example, um, there's these almost all night dance parties that happen where people will get up in groups of two or three with pre-choreographed dances and dancing to music that like rattles your jaw bones. It's so loud, right? It's like floor to ceiling speakers. And um, people will sit around the perimeters of this kind of thatched roof hut. And if you like the music, you go and you spray perfume on the person who's dancing, right? And there's just so much exuberance and joy that is possible even in very dire circumstances. And so I think that um, I don't know, humans are incredible, right? There's, there's always that capacity to celebrate. Yeah, yeah and the, the book doesn't, isn't, is unstinting in its look at hardship, uh, but it doesn't romanticize suffering either. Um, and you highlight people's strength and fortitude and joy in a really powerful way. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Congratulations on your book. Uh, you made a great point about listening, um, and you know we live in a culture of filming everything. And so I'm wondering, mm. did you film any of your conversations? If you did, how did that affect how people reacted, or how do you think that would if you didn't film any? Mm. Yeah, it's something I thought about and ultimately decided against. Um, part of it was that it was just me, and I only have two hands, and there's only so much equipment that I can hold. Part of it was that I didn't want a machine but to be between my face and someone else's face. There's a way, I think, in which audio can be almost more intimate. And I wanted to be able to, you know, have eye contact with someone while they're telling me a story and, and to, you know, lean forward and nod and have all of those cues that are so much, I think, important to and a part of deep listening be felt and, and to create an environment in which that kind of shared intimacy was possible um, non-verbally. And it felt to me like it would be more difficult to do that with a camera. Let me ask you guys something. Would you like to have less light directed at you? I'm getting some nods on less light on the audience desk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, um, thank you. A, so I, I, I have a question. Um, first of all, congratulations on your journey, which was quite epic in itself, but um, given that there are those who do not believe in climate change in some of the areas you traveled to, uh, and your question about climate change was broad enough. Did you ever uh, come across any hostility or any questioning of what you were trying to do? Hmm. Hostility. Um, I, I 
don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Nothing's like immediately coming to mind. I mean, some people thought it was weird, right? But <laughs> like riding a bike show up somewhere and have a cardboard sign, like tell me a story. But um, sometimes people who didn't feel like they had a story of their own would redirect me to someone in a different place who, who did. And there were like a handful of times where I had some uncomfortable interactions that are detailed in more depth in the books. So I won't go into like huge depth on them right now, but um, I think that, so there's this really incredible um, filmmaker named Abby Sun, who I knew when I was an undergrad, and she um, has done some work um, both at rodeos and also jumping trains, where she films people who she jumps the trains with. And before I set off on that first bike trip down the Mississippi River, um, she pulled me aside and she said, Debbie, um, <laughs> the three second rule, let me tell you about this, it's the most important thing. Right. I'm like, sure, what's that? And she said, um, when you meet someone, you decide in the first three seconds whether or not you trust them and go with your gut. And the couple of times it's been dicey have been, has been when I haven't been able to trust the three second rule or I've decided not to for some reason, but I think that there's a lot um, that intuition can help sidestep and, and avoid, but I am yeah, grateful for that advice and for anyone else, feel free to steal it. And if I can post tag something onto that, I would say the, those moments of challenge didn't have to do with the project or no. with climate change. They had to do with the fact that we have not yet achieved the freedom and equality of all women. Yeah. Um, so they were about sexism and about misogyny. Um, yeah. not, about, not about climate change. And I think that's because of the incredible openness that you bring to mm. all of these conversations with the coal engineer, the climate skeptic, oh. um, to everybody. Yeah. Old, young, powerful, not possessed of traditional hierarchical power, everybody. Yeah. Um, so people feel like they can tell you what's on their mind. Yeah, I, that was the hope, right? And I, I really do fundamentally Cheap. believe that everyone has something to teach us if only we take the right. time to listen. Yeah. I think we probably have time for one more, if there is one more. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Um, thank you for such an insightful conversation. This is uh, just a pleasure to listen to. And I was really struck by the sense of care that you bring to communicating the stories that you've encountered, the voices of your interlocutors. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about like the sense of responsibility you might feel as a caretaker of these stories. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that question. So much responsibility. It was something I really thought about a lot in the process of writing this book, right? Um, and it might help to kind of zoom back a little bit to the process of pitching it to publishers in the first place too. So I, um, in 2017, sent around a kind of first version of the book proposal along with my fantastic agent, Tim, <laughs> to 40 different publishers and we got all no's and they were really insightful. Um, one thing that was a, a theme that came out, um, so I had pitched the book as just you know, edited transcripts of the interviews without any intervention from me on the narration side. And I wanted to be like Studs Terkel. <laughs> and um, it, that felt to me like it would be more honest and honoring people's stories. And the feedback that, that some of the editors gave, which I think was really on point, was what's gonna keep someone turning the pages, right? You pick up the book, you read two stories, you feel depressed, and then you want to put it down and leave it, right? And so I realized that it needed narrative sinew, and furthermore, that I had to be the narrative sinew, which made me feel really uncomfortable, frankly, because I didn't want to put that much of myself into the book. And so I was trying to strike a balance where, you know, on the far end of the spectrum, what I really didn't want to do would be to like use people's stories as my own self-actualization, because that's not what, I, what the point is, right? <laughs> um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, would be um, just not putting any of myself in there at all. And so I tried to add just enough of that narrative sinew to guide the reader and to give a sense of place and what it felt like to be there. Um, and then the other aspect that I guess I wanted to touch on is sort of the longer term responsibility to these stories and these storytellers. Um, I'm still in touch with many of them and, and it's really interesting to hear about their lives longitudinally but also my hope is that the audio recorded on the journey can become a part of an archive such that someone in the future could listen in on it. I've had really incredible experiences in archives myself. 
um, whether that's you know reading letters or diaries or things like that. And, and I think it'll be really interesting, you know, 50, 100, 200 years from now from someone to be able to look back and see how people were talking about climate change from 2014 to 2019. Um, and so I think part of honoring the stories is also preserving them for the future. And recognizing that you're providing a kind of leadership about listening and about compassion and about what we need to new, move forward. And to do that, I didn't know about the scheme of the edited transcripts until this moment. To do that, you have to be present. Yeah. And so that's an, a contradiction that you had to metabolize. That's so mm. interesting to hear. Yeah, it's a weird role to play, but one that I, I try to take very seriously and just do my best in every step to honor the stories, honor the storytellers, to see each story as a gift, and to like express gratitude towards people, because I think that that's so important as well. But because of the way you're present in the book, I can say this with confidence, having read it twice now, there's so, you establish so much trust with the reader, mm. and that's because we trust you. It's not that we otherwise wouldn't trust the other people, but it's because we trust you. Yeah, well, thank you, I appreciate that. So I think it's probably time for you to go have some one-on-one -on -one conversations sure. with yeah. your um, audience here and um, for you guys to reserve your signed copies at the Strand. I did want to close by saying how happy it makes me to remember um, and thank you for reconstructing this through the, the archive that is Gmail. Yes. Um, <laughs> that Debbie and I first met in 2017 before the Climate Museum had done any programming of its own. I'd been asked to speak at a, another museum in Washington, D.C., and you came out for that mm -hmm. event because it was climate-themed. Um, and you hadn't started writing the book, or we had both just only started to flesh out these ideas that we had about interventions that we thought had a chance of being helpful on climate change. So it is such an honor and joy yeah. to be able to do this book launch with you. Um, as we both discovered that um, moving these projects forward is both a long process and kind of, in geological terms, a very short one, right? Yeah, blink so, of an eye, yeah. <laughs> congratulations, Devin. Thank you so much, and congrats to you for all the work with the Climate Museum, too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's put our hands together for Devin. And, and she'll be waiting to chat with you one-on-one -on -one out by the registration table. So I hope you guys will take advantage of that. She's just as lovely one-on-one -on -one as she is in this setting. Thank you. Miranda Massey and Debbie Lockwood, thank you so much, ladies, for that wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Well, everyone, what an incredible last couple of days. We want to thank you so much for joining us here at the Nest Summit. And again, please make sure you go out to the lobby area where you can have a one-on-one -on -one chat with Debbie. We also want to remind you that if you missed any of the sessions, you can always visit them on our website, thenestsummit.com. But before you go, we do invite you to stay and watch an award-winning, highly acclaimed short film by Sean Gallagher. Again, on behalf of everyone here, our guests, our presenters, and the folks at the Nest Summit, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.